from Hollywood, it's the, 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 the Tom Micah Show. I want it now. And now. And now. Here he is. Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of a radio talk program. We're the radio talk show that is not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No! I am your host. Write down our toll-free telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1-800-5800-TALK. 1-800-5800-866. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. Here we are together again on the radio. And in this segment of our program, I want you to meet someone who is a hero. He's a hero to me. And for many of you guys, he should be a hero to you. And if you've never heard of him, you're going to find out why coming up. Because our guest, Bert Riddick has had the nightmare of dealing with something that we talk about on this program in theory all the time. I tell you what could happen to you if you got into these circumstances. Bert has lived it. It's been his life. And rather than just sitting back and taking it, he has fought back. I'm just thrilled to have him here. Bert Riddick, thank you for joining us on the program. Hey, Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I first found out about you from the former California State Assemblyman Rod Wright, who was here on the show. And um, he was having a hard time getting some legislation passed. And uh, before we get to your specific story, can you tell us about that law? Sure. Um, Rod's bill, which was the original Fraternity Justice Act uh, of 2002, you know, we we had stumbling blocks and and uh, stop signs all on the way, mostly from the women's rights groups with that uh, uh, coin phrase, "best interest of the child." Bull, you know, that was the major uh, obstacle for us. Uh, we wound up uh, submitting a, a kind of a watered down version of Rod's bill. Um, got through the Assembly and Senate, you know, with a lot of red pen applied to it. Got to Gray Davis's desk and he vetoed it. So, did it ever get passed into law? No, nope, didn't get passed. Like I said, we passed the assembly and the Senate. But uh, Gray Davis uh, basically wrote a veto message saying that uh, for the for us to pass that law, the state risks losing up to forty million dollars. So basically, what he said was the financial incentive of fraternity fraud is more important than uh, justice for the victims and their families. Now, before I have you tell your story, and I think your story is is fascinating, and it's one that young men need to hear, because many of these boys call in and tell their stories about riding bareback and having sex without a condom, and uh, they, they, they uh, talk about uh, their girlfriend wanting to have a baby and blah, blah, blah. Uh, a lot of them are not aware of what they might be getting themselves into, and your story, I think, is very important for them to hear. But before we get to that, what would this law have done had it been passed full strength? What was the purpose of it? Well, it was about paternity fraud. Correct. The purpose of the law was to allow you to dismiss child support cases uh, based on genetic evidence. Uh, the state of California was one of, uh, one of the majority of states that had not uh, addressed this problem before. At the time, I believe there were only six states that had corrected this issue. So basically it says, you know, you, you, either you didn't know at first or you found out, uh, later on that you, your spouse or your girlfriend had multiple partners, you found out it's not your kid, uh, unfortunately because you're outside of the 30 day window for a fraternity establishment, you're locked in and you got a kid for 18 years. And, and in most cases, it's going to be longer than that because you're going to have the rearages piled up on you. So what the law would do is give you a window of opportunity to, uh, submit your genetic evidence and then um, get your case dismissed, get your urges wiped to zero. Now, I'm looking at the uh, Daily Breeze, which had a story that many listeners sent to us about you, and it says here, and I want to clarify this, because it says here that a piece of legislation that you helped fight for went into effect in 2005, establishing a new procedure for challenging paternity, including informing a man of his right to genetic testing. Uh, Did that law go into effect? 
Absolutely. What happened was after uh, Gray Davis uh, punched us in the gut with his uh, pen on the initial bill, we went back and uh, we kept beating the pavement, trips, emails, calls to Sacramento, uh, uh, and Senator uh, Asper, and finally uh, drafted uh, another piece of legislation. Uh, we partnered with another assembly member, and we finally got that through with, and, and uh, Rod Wright's bill, like I said, was a little bit watered down. This one was flooded by the time we got it to the powers that be. And basically what this bill said that for de default judgments only, you can get them dismissed, meaning you never had your day in court, you don't know the kid, you didn't hold the kid out to be your own. Those cases, you have a two-year window uh, in which from the time you know or should have known that it's not your child, you can get your case dismissed based on DNA. Wow. All right, uh, let's talk about you and your story, because, uh, again, we have a lot of young guys who listen to this show, and I try to tell them uh, stories, uh, whether it be your specific story, or theoretically what could happen to people who don't pay attention, and this includes people who've been falsely accused of being fathers. Uh, tell us your story. This story began with a girlfriend you had. How many years ago was that? Uh, let's see. That would have been... Well, 18 years. The kid, actually, in my case, just turned 18. So this woman I had a relationship with 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Hmm. So you had a relationship, and it ended? Yeah, we ended the relationship. Uh, you know, when I met my wife, we, uh, we were pretty much together from that point on. You know, So about two years into our relationship um, is when apparently... This woman went and filed, had a baby, filed uh, child support uh, documents, and uh, named me as the father. Did you know you had been named the father in this case? No. Well, what happens is they serve, they, the, the paperwork is filed, they serve to, you know, whatever they think is your residence. At the time, my paperwork was served. Uh, I happened to be in New York on business. Um, came back, and, you know, and then, you know, my wife showed me that she was, we weren't married at the time, but we were living together. So I was in the paperwork, you know, what's, what, you know, basically what's this bitch trying to do now type of thing, you know. And I'm like, you know what, she's been blowing smoke, you know, since day one, just, you know, worry about it, you know. Not knowing what I know today <laughs> about the law. So that would be my first, this is the first segue into a lesson for any of these kids who uh, potentially could get into something like this. If you get served with any legal document from the court, you need to respond immediately. Uh, technically, you have a 30-day window. Uh, I, I would go down. I, would, I think it would be worthwhile to go down the very next day, if at all possible. One of the things day. Rod Wright told me, and this wasn't your case, but one of the things he told me was that, and you may know more about this than I do. I suspect you do. So correct me if I'm wrong. But what he told me was that um, the mother of a newborn... Uh, puts down an address that would be the last known address of the father. And that in some cases, <laughs> women say, oh, I don't know where he is, and they put down their own address because they live together or because they spent the most time there or whatever. And so the notice comes to the address of the mother who, you know, promptly disposes of the notice. And uh, so essentially you're never served. There's no proof of service. And then later on you find out the hard way where your paycheck's being garnished or something like that. That's absolutely right. Uh, and for most guys, that is the way they find out, through a wage garnishment or notice from DMV that the license has been suspended. And there's, uh, you know, the, the the actual service, process of service is just one part of it. The, the, the term that applies would be father shopping. What happens is these women take a look and they say, you know what, I got this guy over here and this guy over here. This guy has a good job. This other guy, you know, has no job to live at home with his mom and no income. I'm going to put the guy down with the, making the money. So it's father shopping is the, is the initial source of the problem. So you found out that you were named the father and you ignored the letter and went on with your life, uh, with your new wife. Right. And uh, what happened then? Well, um, uh, a while after that, I got a letter with my, along with my paycheck saying that you know, my wages would be garnished. And not just to be garnished, but to garnish at fifty percent of my my salary, uh, and that was the first notice. Other than that first uh, uh, piece of paper 
they left on my doorstep. That was the first interaction I had with them. So, um, actually, I took it back. That's the first notice that I knew that I was going to be garnished. Um, a few weeks after um, the paperwork, I went over to the Department of Justice Services in Torrance and explained to them, look, I know I'm a little bit outside my window, but I want to go ahead and take care of this. Um, um, this is not my kid, you know, do whatever you guys do, blood test, you know, DNA test, whatever, and let's, you know, let's get it over with. The response I got was, sorry, you're outside of your 30-day window, you know, um, you know, we'll be in touch. They're, what they mean by being in touch would be that they start the garnishment on you. They'd be in touch with your wallet is what they'd be Correct. in touch with. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and again, you mentioned the, the young listeners. You know, Tom, it's funny. When I go down, one of the things you have to do when you go down in these cases, you have a hearing down in the Commonwealth Building uh, in downtown L.A. I think uh, sitting in that room with all these victims and listening to these stories should be a mandatory part of sex education in schools because if you have to go through that, if you've got a feeling for what you have to go through with these, going through these pitches, you would never, never, you would protect yourself at all costs. Now, did you know for a fact at this point uh, in the story, did you know for a fact you were not the father of this child? Absolutely. I mean, I hadn't seen this woman in, uh, like I said, it was probably two years. Wow. And uh, pregnancy is nine months, so mathematically that would be impossible. Well, All right. they, they told me you were smart. <laughs> now, they, uh, now, they took, uh, so they started taking money out of your paycheck. How much were they taking? Like I said, it was half of my salary, and um, I forget even how much. I, I mean, the story in the daily breeze. The story in the daily breeze says about fourteen hundred dollars a month. Yeah, it hasn't always been that. Like I said, I was making different amounts at different periods, but basically, they have the right to take up to fifty percent of your salary. Regardless, and, and and keep in mind that doesn't mean that regardless of if you're making twenty dollars an hour or eight dollars an hour. So imagine a guy who's only making eight dollars an hour has a new family, and now you're taking half of his his. Paycheck. And uh, you had you had your own son uh, a year or two into your relationship with your wife, correct? Absolutely. I had a, we had a one boy at the time. We now have three kids. Uh, and it's funny, a little while later, uh, so that's when I began basically job hopping. Uh, and during the time where I changed jobs, they had no idea of knowing where I was at. So uh, they weren't obviously weren't getting any money. You know, I've never voluntarily paid a cent for this kid, and I never will. So they garnish you. Uh, what happened with me was they found out uh, where I was living, and I got off work one morning, pulled the driveway, and the sheriff pulled behind me, and arrested me in front of my wife and my son. They arrested you? The sheriff, uh, the sheriff's department arrested you in front of your wife and son? Came to my house and arrested me for failure to provide. You know, I'm a deadbeat dad in their eyes. Wow. So you were taken in and booked like a criminal? Yeah, I was taken downtown. Unfortunately, it had to be a holiday weekend, so I wound up staying three days before I could see uh, go to court. And uh, in actuality, it wound up being a good thing because when we finally did get the court proceedings rolling, the criminal court judge, uh, after hearing the story, he said, you know, this is bull. He said, I'm ordering a DNA test, and I want the DA's office to pay for it. At the time, it was under the jurisdiction of the DA. Today, it's a state organization. So uh, he ordered the genetic testing. Um, and ordered them to pay for it, and that was the only way I was ever able to get the testing done. So when you got the uh, results of the DNA test and it showed that you were not the father, uh, you would hope that would be the end of it, but w what actually happened? Well, first of all, I was overjoyed, you know. I made the call the wife and told her it was over. Uh, and then about two or three weeks later, I get another notice saying that they're taking my money still. So at that point, that's when I realized that what they're telling me is that the criminal, the criminal proceedings are over, but the civil case stays open. So they're dismissing the criminal case. I'm not a deputy dad. Uh, however, I still have to pay for this kid for the next 18 years. Unbelievable. We'll take a break here. We're going to come back with our guest. His name is Bert Riddick, and he's telling the story of this just unbelievable unbelievable experience of having to pay child support for all these years for a kid that wasn't his. This is something you need to pay attention to, and your telephone calls are coming up as well. Tom, Tom, Tom Likas, 1-800-5800-TOM. Pipe down, I'm talking to Tom now. The Tom Likas Show. It's 
The Tom Likas Show. Our guest is Bert Riddick. And he has been the poster child for paternity fraud. Now, what's amazing about his story is that he paid uh, child support all these years, even though he knew he's not the father of this child. And, um, all right, Bert, so we, we got you now. Uh, there you are, jumping from job to job, and they keep uh, finding you and digging you. They arrested you. Where did it go from there? Well, basically, right away, what I did was I filed a motion to set aside based on uh, the genetic testing, and uh, that was denied. And basically, that's when I knew that this problem was much bigger than me. So you learned all this the hard way, stuff that we now talk about on this program. You're the guy who actually found a lot of this out, and it was all these stories that Rod Wright was bringing to the forefront uh, that brought it to our attention. But you were the one who had to find it out the hard way. Yeah, it's not the 15 minutes of fame I was looking for, but um, it, you know, I fell into it, and um, and fortunately, like I said, we were able to uh, change the law through the Swartz of Year. All right, so uh, this went on for, uh, you paid for how many years, ultimately? Uh, I've been paying, I've been in this mix for about a decade now. And you're uh, still paying? Absolutely. I go back on the 27th, for what I hope is the last time. Now, did I read a, uh, in that Daily Breeze story that you actually ran into the mother of this child? Yeah, back at a hearing in April, uh, went over to the, to the courts, and uh, I believe that's a day where her and her daughter came and did the second DNA test. And I saw them sitting in the back of the room, uh, and I thought about it for a little while, and I said, you know what, I'm going over there. So I went over and I sat behind him and I asked the girl, you know, who she was. She said, I asked her, I said, are you Noel? She said, yes. I said, hi, my name is Bert Riddick. I'm the man your mom's been stealing money for, from for the past decade. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, if this is a little kid, I never would have done that. But this girl is 18 years old. She has the right to know not only that I'm not her father, but in reality, she has the right, she has the right to know who her father is, you know. Uh -huh. There's not just uh, moral reasons, but there's genetic reasons, you know. What if, assuming he's black, what if he has, his family has sickle cell or something? He's sure. Like to know and get uh, early treatment for that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, they they were not very pleased, but, uh, you know, she needed to hear it. How did she react? Uh, she, you know, she said, her response was, well, yeah, you're my dad. I said, no, I'm not your dad, and your mother knows I'm not your dad. And I said, even if uh, she tried to fake it, she knew from the t first time she got the results of the first blood test that I'm not your dad. And then I looked at her mother. I said, how can you sit here and lie to this girl all her life? You know, she's sitting here hating some guy for no reason. You know, in reality, she should be spending time with her father. And did she respond? No, they got up. Uh, first, she told me I needed to leave. And I said, you know what? It looks like a public place to me. You don't like what I'm hearing. You need to get up and walk away or call security. That's what I told her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And did you also say that you had met her one time before? I, uh, If I read in the story correctly, she was in a brand new Mercedes and you met her at a bus stop? Yeah, I was on the bus stop on my way to work. Uh, one of the things. They tell us why. You, tell us why you were at the bus stop. Well, one of the things they do to you after you owe a certain amount of child support is they suspend your driver's license and take your passport. So I'm taking the bus into my job for the city of Redondo Beach. Uh, person pulls up, blows a horn, and I'm thinking, you know, some guy trying to get the uh, attention of one of the little cute girls on the bus stop or something. Well, when I look again, it's the person pointed at me and motioning for me to come here. Now, I hadn't seen this woman, and uh, at the time, I guess it had been like eight or nine years. So it took me a while, but then I realized it was her. So I thought for a second, I said, okay, do I bust the windshield or do I get in? So I, went, I got in, and I uh, you know, went a few, a couple of blocks with her, asked her what the hell she was doing, why is she doing it. I, and I told her, I said, you know what, I'll sign anything you want right now, saying I'll never sue you. All I want you to do is dismiss this case. I don't need anything from you. Anything from you, I can make my own money. Just dismiss it. It's ridiculous. And I, and I brought up the uh, health ramifications to her at that time. She turned totally pale because she never thought about that. All she knows is that she can go to Nordstrom's instead of Kmart. You know, so the health of her child and the well-being of her child meant nothing to her. 
But uh, I, I want to make sure people understand this part because it's so important. You're at the bus stop because your driver's license was taken away. She was a brand new Mercedes that, in all probability, you were helping to pay for. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. You know, it was a very humbling experience, to say the least. And she told you the truth, didn't she? Absolutely. Well, I don't know if it was the truth, but she insinuated that she had been part of a date rape, you know. And this guy was a loser, you know, he didn't have anything and possibly never would. She was still mad at me for what happened, I guess at this point it was four years ago when we had broken up and she named this paternity action. So she decided to put my name down. She knew I'd always have a good job, make okay money. So she knew she'd always have a fat check coming through every month. Outrageous. All right, and finally here now, all right, so you're waiting now for the outcome of what? Well, I'm waiting. Uh, again, I submitted another motion to set this case aside um, based on the new law. And uh, a part of that, what I also did was I waited a while because I wanted to uh, try to utilize uh, there's a the Navarro decision where uh, they decided that the man should be compensated. And I tried to add that to mine. Will I see a penny from this from the state? I doubt it. But I wanted to add some wording that says dismiss my case and reopen my initial case Give me all the money you took from me subsequent from the initial filing. Which I think is only fair. I mean, it's amazing that we, uh, uh, those of us who are in favor of paternity fraud legislation are kind of being told, well, even if that legislation gets through, we have to accept the idea that whatever you've put into the uh, black hole stays in the black hole. Right. And there'll be lawsuits for this. It's just the beginning of the problem. Has uh, has this woman uh, tried to get you to stop what you're doing or ask you to leave her alone or ask you to stop the legal proceedings? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got distracted there. I'm, not, I'm at work. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I, no, I understand. Uh, the woman who had this child who claimed you were the father, has she tried to get you to stop with all the legal proceedings and everything? Um, the woman, I have had, haven't had any interactions with this woman, uh, like other than the two incidents I described, you know. So she hasn't contacted she, your attorney no, or a representative or anybody? No, and, and I've done all this on my own. Um, and so she didn't know how to get in touch with me. I didn't know how to get in touch with her. But I think the thing that your listeners need to understand is that uh, going back to the criminal court being, criminal case being dismissed and a civil staying open, the Department of Child Support Services gets federal matching funds for every child support case that they can report to them. So that's their incentive for keeping all these cases open. So if they can say they're getting money from a man, whether it's the right man or not, they get federal incentives for that. So they get money from the federal government. So now, in addition to assisting this woman in her fraudulent actions, they're actually contributing to the fraud. And, and there's also, to take a step further, in the federal child support guidelines, there's a, a Health and Human Services has a guideline that says, uh, as far as paternity establishment, it says no money should be collected in an unwed parental situation until paternity is established. So the fact that the state takes money from all these guys on default judgments, they're taking it fraudulently, and they're accepting the federal matching fund fraudulently. Yeah, so I, for, I, I for one, have always advocated mandatory DNA testing for every live birth in our society. Uh, absolutely. You know, there was a study in the state of Michigan did a study, and they, they came up to the conclusion, number one, not only did it help them with accuracy, but it really didn't cost them anything extra. You got all three parties there. You got the baby there. You know, just do it there and get it over with. You have to wonder how many of these pregnancies would never happen if women knew they would have to pay the piper, or more importantly, have to pay the expenses of that baby. Exactly. And, and you know, the, the, you just said it. They, part of the reason why we go through this is because women know that they're not going to be held accountable. So now, on that form, I've perjured myself. Not only will nothing happen if they find out about it, but the State Department of Child Support Services will still help me get this money from the falsely accused dad. Unbelievable. Now, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with some phone calls for our guest, Bert Riddick. It's an amazing story, and now we're going to let you have at it. Tom like it. 1-800-5800-TOM. If there's a hell, I'm going. You say that now, and you joke about it now. You know what kind of talk show I could do in hell? I could imagine the guests I could have in there, Hitler, Mussolini. Right. I'd be the Larry King of hell. It'd be great. The Tom Likas Show.
Ricky Show from Hollywood. At 1-800-5800-TOM. Thank you for tuning in. And now we go to your phone calls for our guest, Bert Riddick. Fighting paternity fraud. Essentially a one-man battle here. Just amazing. All right, let's say hello here to uh, Kristen on the Tom Likas show. For our guest, Bert Riddick. Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you? Great. <laughs> Good. Uh, you know, you had a similar subject not too long ago, and I was so passionate. I dialed and dialed, couldn't get through. I, I see many sides of this subject. I'm on, on many sides of this, but Mr. Riddick, I am on your side. I am a mother, a single mother. I know how you feel about us, Tom. I married a man who also has a child from a former relationship. I do not get child support from my former husband. My position was that it wasn't worth fighting. However, I am familiar recently, my husband's former wife went to the Child Support Enforcement Bureau after uh, a court told them that they should not be involved prior, two years prior, saying that um, we owed more than 7000 in arrearages. Meanwhile, um, we are now being, um, we have garnishments coming out. They're trying to go after my husband for um, uh, his license. Uh, federal tax returns. Most importantly, as I was researching this, I am right there with Mr. I'm sorry, is it Riddick? I already said the name, but yes. I apologize. Mr. Riddick? Yes. Um, I, I was shocked to find that states, in fact, do get um, basically incentives to collect not from men who owe, but men who have money. Well, to collect from anybody. Well, but most men who owe, or many, and I say this respectfully, a lot of men who owe don't have the money. My husband, we have proven in, in, in October 2006, when we received the call that my husband was in fact behind, I took every check going back to 1998. Not only did we pay, we overpaid by $4,000 trying to assist. They refused to return a phone call. They refused to acknowledge any letter, nothing. It wasn't until, as it turns out, my husband and I, we work for the same company. I'm actually in the accounting department. They contacted the company because of the arrearages, and they wanted to garnish his wages. They left a phone number, and I said, honey, you know, I know they're not returning your call. Here we are now in April 2007. Here's the number of the woman that called you or called me. Here's the number. She proceeded to threaten both of us with legal action because I gave her direct line. You are not allowed to give the direct line. You have to go through customer service. What does that mean? You get no return from call. No, no return well, from I, call. I, you know, I, I, what I don't want to do is turn this into a, a thing where people call in with their horror stories. I know there's a million of them out there. What I want people to know is that fraud is okay. Fraud is acceptable as long as you are a pregnant woman who's trying to get money. Fraud is acceptable. And that's the that's the most offensive thing about this. If I'm going in the wrong direction, I apologize. But you are absolutely 100% correct. In fact, we were told that day the burden of proof is not on the person who made the claim. The burden of proof is on the person who has been claimed against. And the bottom line is they're not going to listen to you. Did he hear about the person in New Mexico who, who claimed that there was a child that did not exist? $20,000 later. Yeah, we talked about that story, too. Did. I apologize. I apologize. Governor Richardson is fighting that. We are now talking with Gover Governor Richardson. It, you can go in, and there is no there's no legal ramification for someone who can go in there and lie. Right. They can sign an affidavit and say whatever they want, and I wouldn't be so adamant if I wasn't on two sides of the fence. Like I said, I get no child support. I could have fought that, too. Yeah, I understand. But we're going to move on here, Krista. But I thank you for the call. It's 1-800-5800-TOM. That is our telephone number. Let's say hello here to Melissa on the Tom Likas show for Burt Riddick. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but I just wanted to make sure that all of your listeners knew that I live in L.A. County, so I'm not sure if it's just L.A. County or if it is for the all of the state of California, that when a child is born, in order to put the father's name on the birth certificate, they have to sign a declaration of paternity form that says that they will be responsible for paternity. I know that um, this has been in effect at least 10 years, because so my daughter just turned 10 last week, and she had to have that form signed in order to get well, let's ask Bert. Bird. Is that is that the case, Bert? Um, she, she's partially right. The, uh, there is uh, such a document, Declaration of Paternity. Uh, I was not present when this child was born, nor when the uh, paper was signed. But um, you know, it didn't matter to them. One of the things we did after Great Davis's veto, we had a paternity work group up north, and that's one of the things we addressed. We said that you can, you've got to stop 
forcing these kids to sign this declaration of paternity because what happens is they, they don't know. They're in joy. They got a new baby, you know. They're, 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 they're clueless. And they don't, the last thing in their mind is to think that maybe this baby isn't theirs. So they're forced into signing it uh, in, this, in this beautiful moment of childbirth. And then later on, what winds up happening is that they find out it's theirs. The State Department says, you know what, too bad. You signed this declaration of paternity back on this day. Right, but Bert wasn't there, so Bert was not required to sign, and they were not no. required to have his signature in order to get money. Do you understand, Melissa? No, I understand, and one of my comments is this hasn't been happening for a long enough period of time. My cousin is 16. He didn't have to have this form in order for my aunt to put the name of the father on the birth certificate. My daughter, who just turned 10, I did have to have it. So this is relatively new, only within the last decade that this form has been required. But even then, um, I, it's outrageous that uh, the form exists uh, or that yeah. it has to be signed at a moment like that, that you can't uh, be given uh, a month or a year or five years to think about signing oh, it's, it. It's 10 days. You have I know, I know that. Uh, that is why we need mandatory DNA testing, so that yeah. a man does not have to go to a woman and have her go, what do you think I am, a slut? You think I'm a slut? And that, they have it all set up. The whole thing is rigged so that guys just sign these papers and agree that they're the father without having uh, any way to wiggle out or to, to find out the truth. No, I com I completely agree, but I just wanted to let your listeners know it is out there, and if they are presented with it and they have any hesitation, don't sign it. Yeah, good point. By, by the way, Bert, I think one way to solve this problem or to help solve it would be if the federal government would say you're not getting a dime unless we have DNA evidence that uh, this child is the you know the fa this is the father of this child. That's exactly where it's going to need to come from, you know. But uh, will that happen? Who knows? We're trying to put more visibility to this problem so that maybe the federal government will put more pressure on the state. Absolutely. It's Bobby on the Tom Like a Show for Burt Riddick. All right. It's Rico for to on the Tom Like a Show for Burt Riddick. Hello. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. Hey, um, I just had a couple of questions. I caught the tail end of the conversation, and the more I hear about this, the more it's pissing me off um, about what this guy's going through. I feel really bad for him, but my question is, I, I believe I heard he said uh, he's going on the 27th of this month for the uh, what he hopes to be the final court date. Was that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions that I had is if they prove that this, you know, obviously this isn't your child um, and you don't, you can stop paying, are they going to, what kind of ramifications are they going to have on the lady to pay you back? Or is the actual father going to have to pay you back? You said you've been doing this for a decade. I, uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bert, but isn't it, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to get the money back from the state. The state collected the money from you. You're trying to get it back from the state. And then it's the state's problem to figure out who to get the money back from. Correct. Uh, I'm going to try to get the money back from the state, but I'm also going to uh, file a separate civil action against the mother. Good, good. Well, I'm they're both liable, you know. If she doesn't have anything, garnish her check like you did to me. But now, my other question was, too, you know, is anything going to happen to the actual father? He should be the one paying. Who knows? Who knows who that person is? Yeah, I hear <laughs> that. <Is there> anybody. <laughs> well, well, I, I hope she... good luck to you, man. I hope you get every every dime back. All right, I appreciate it. Rico, thank you for the call. Holly on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Um, hey. I just wanted to thank you so much for taking up this noble cause that I had never even heard of. I mean, this totally freaks me out. I'm always trying to warn my nephews of what girls can get them into and, you know, the ramifications for life that can happen. And, um, uh, you know, I just, I didn't know that there was all these fraud cases attached. This is, this is like, this is, uh, the, I mean, I can't believe this is going on in our country. Well, not only that, Holly, fraud is legal. If we're talking about a woman who's pregnant. I, I, I know. This is this is horrible. My husband and I are always talking about how all the laws, you know, I mean, everything. You have to be the worst mother in the world, practically, like, on crack and, you know, in jail to lose custody of your kid. I mean, it has to be that bad. And still, time and time again, custody is always awarded to the woman for just, like, out of default. And I just can't believe that people can be frauded like this in this country. This is just terrible. And this guy's whole life has been ruined, and he's got kids, of, legitimate kids of his own. This has got to be falling back on them. And, and by the way, uh, although Bert is certainly the poster boy for this, 
there's thousands of guys here in California who are going through the same thing. Unbelievable. I mean, my, this is just terrible. My heart goes out to them. And I mean, for you to bring this to, you know, forefront, I mean, I don't hear anybody talking about this. And this is just, seriously, it's a noble cause you're taking up. And I do hear you talk of this, you know, speak about this subject all the time, a lot of times in humor, which is great also. But, I mean, in this instance, this is like cold, hard facts. Well, what this, let me there. tell you something. What this is all about is the government, you got all those guys who run for office saying they don't want to raise taxes. And uh, what they're doing is, uh, rather than the people who are responsible for creating these children paying the bill, uh, they are uh, attaching the wages of perfectly innocent citizens. Uh, but there aren't enough of them to... Lo- I'm sorry, Bert, you're coming out. Uh, you're cutting out there, Bert. I'm sorry. All right, why don't we put Bert on hold and see if we can get a better connection on him. Uh, because uh, uh, you, you can barely hear what he's saying, but you hear what yeah, I'm saying. We need to hear him. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, no, we, we definitely do. He's saying we definitely do. Uh, yeah, but th- that, that's what it's all about. It's about the government instead of raising taxes on all of us, because everyone says, "Oh, there's too much welfare and there's too much this." They found a way po- that's politically acceptable to most people to take the money out of the pockets of certain individuals, so that the broad populace doesn't get their taxes raised. Well, I don't believe that, you know, making a bigger government and a bigger bu- bigger bureaucracy out of this is the way of going about it. I think we need to go after the perpetrators, and those are the women that are bringing these cases. But, yeah, but the perpetrators are the legislature that made the laws so that it's easy to defraud people out of their money. Absolutely, absolutely. Easy for the women, to, you know, to defraud. The, the, it, there should be serious consequences for this kind of fraud. For these kind of accusations, these women should be in jail. They should have their kids taken away from them. This is awful. Yeah, I I totally understand where you're coming from. Bernard, we didn't hear the last thing you said. Could you say that again, please? Well, well, I was just uh, in reference to what she was saying. There are things we didn't even talk about, such as what they do as far as your credit report, your lien on on your property, uh, tax liens. uh, You know, there's so many things. I mean, I can't even get someone to rent to me, not because... I signed for something, credit didn't pay it, or I've been lax on my bills because, you know, of tax liens placed by the Department of Child Support Services and the state of California. So, I mean, I've, I got my family right now living in a motel. Unbelievable. Good. Unbelievable. Mark on the Tom Likas show for Bert Riddick. Hello. Hey, Tom. How you doing? Great. Bert, it's Bert. This is Mark from Redondo Beach. We go out sometimes. Haven't seen you in a while. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm good. Tom, I just want to tell you, I've known Bert for about eight years, and while he's been going through this, never once has he lost his cool, straight-up guy, um, loves his, his real family, and um, Bert, I'm behind you 100%, man. I heard you on the radio. I had to call and just say right on, and um, you have my number. You're supposed to give me a call. I appreciate <laughs> it, man. It means a lot to me, man. Yeah, you know, Tom, like I said, he's a straight-up guy. He's been going through some hell, and, uh, you know, you never hear him once complain. He's just handling the business and getting it done. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's why we have him here. I really think that uh, that he's a hero. He's the hero a lot of men have not heard about. Now, now, Bert, at this point in time, I know we got a lot of guys out there who are saying, what what can we do in this situation? What can we do to help? What can we do to protect ourselves? Uh, what would you recommend guys to well, the main thing is is to get test, get some genetic testing in, in all cases. You know, find out as early in the game as possible. Uh, if you have to do it on the download, then do that. But the bottom line to get tested, seventy uh, percent of the over seventy percent of the default judgments in California come out to be false paternity. So that means that in over seven out of the ten cases, the woman has lied. So, you know, I know you love your lady, you love your wife, your girlfriend, whoever it is, but you got to get tested and hit nip this thing in the bud and, and, and fix it at the beginning. Right now, the law says you got two years from the time you've known or you should have known that it wasn't your kid. And at that point, you have the option, you have the window still open to get this thing taken care of. After that, sorry, you got a kid for life. Outrageous. Bird Riddick, thank you so much for spending this time with us. We appreciate it. The Tom Likas Show.